way in the back.
Welcome everyone. It's good to see you all this day. Welcome to family and friends alike. Welcome to Holy Cross Church. It's an honor to officiate at this service, not just because of the kind of man that Gary was, we all realize that, but because anyone who is made in the image and likeness of God surely must return to God. And that's why this is such an honor. It could be anyone, but certainly uh, for a man like Gary, it's a real honor to stand before you and to officiate today. So welcome to you all. He has, of course, passed into the nearer presence of God and is at peace and rest and will continue to grow in the things of God, we believe. And so it's good that we're here. We ran out of bulletins. So uh, you're going to have to look on to a person next to you, those who came in at the very end, uh, so that when we uh, say Psalm 103 together, you might have to fake it a little bit. That's all right. Um, at any rate, uh, I think we have bulletins for most people, but um, but you'll notice there is a, 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 a an order in there for Psalm 103, and we'll be saying that together uh, here shortly. And I believe that's about uh, all that needs to be said before we uh, get started. Again, welcome to you all uh, on this very special occasion. Would you please stand for the procession? shall never die. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Please be seated. If it is comfortable for you, please kneel and let us pray. Oh God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, Joy, death, and brought life and immortality to life. Grant that your servant Gary, being raised with Christ, may know the strength of his presence and rejoice in his eternal glory. Who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, deal graciously with those who mourn, especially the family here present. Surround them with your love they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may now please be seated for the Isaiah reading. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here ends the reading. Please stand for Psalm 103. We're going to read this song antiphonally. That means that I'll read the first half of the verse, but for the asterisk, we will read 
second half all the way through the song. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, praise, praise his holy name. name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And, and forget, forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sin. And heals all your infirmities. Who saves your life from the pit. And crowns you with mercy and loving kindness. Who satisfies you with good things. Renewing your youth like the eagles. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy also toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west. So far as he set our sins from us. As a father pities his own children. So is the Lord merciful to those who fear him. For he knows whereof we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. The days of man are as grass. He flourishes as a flower of the field. For as soon as the wind goes over it, it is gone. And his place shall know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures forever and ever upon those who fear him. And his righteousness upon children's children. Even upon those who keep his covenant. And to think upon his commandments to do them. The Lord has prepared his throne in heaven. And, and his kingdom rules over all. So praise the Lord, the angels of his, ye that excel in strength. You that fulfill his commandment and hearken unto the voice of his words. So praise the Lord, all you his hosts. You servants of his that do his pleasure. So speak good of the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Amen. reading from the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger of sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. Please stand for a reading of the gospel. Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. But where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. sense it's a strange thing to speak of the life of another person because all life is in God and God is beyond all explanation but in moments like these we do our best the truth is we must come to a place like this and do this why is that because our lives 
all of our lives are intertwined. And when a loved one has crossed the veil, something of us goes with them. It is as the famous poet John Donne said almost 400 years ago in his famous meditation, you probably heard it, no man is an island entire of himself. Every man is a piece of the continent. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. We were all involved in Gary's life, a part of his life. And when he is gone, we surely feel it. When we see the empty wheelchair, which is a symbol of his strength, not of his weakness, we feel it. And so we've come here this afternoon to try to understand this and to do this very strange thing, almost impossible, of talking about the precious life of a loved one, all mixed up with our own try to figure out what that means. Even now, I think the symbols around us, if we have eyes to see, are helping us answer that question. They may not be what we expected to see when we came in. For example, I'm wearing white, a white stole, the color of victory, not a black one. The Paschal candle is lit, this candle right here, and it only gets lit two times, two other times in the year, the Christian year. At baptisms, times of rebirth, and during the most celebrate, celebrative time of the national year, which of course is Easter. And so the point is this, anytime we gather at a funeral, a memorial service, it's an Easter service. A service that points to victorious resurrection, the idea that life continues on after death. And if we believe what the New Testament says, it continues on in a most spectacular kind of way. The most basic belief in the Christian faith is that particularity, listen to the words, particularity survives death. Individuality survives death. And if you look at what happened to Jesus, some form of embodiment awaits. So in other words, Gary is right now all the Gary he ever was, but even more, if you can believe that. For he is in the nearer presence of God, and God has it, as he does for all of us, that Gary is perfected in him. You notice no doubt that the service began with one of the most famous of Jesus' sayings, I am the resurrection and the life. And when we hear those words, we need to understand that they have a deeper application than to Jesus' own power as the, as the unique manifestation of God. They speak to that same power, really, residing in all of us that will raise us up at the last. The divine life, in other words, which was in Jesus in its fullness, which is also in us, only in part, will raise us to newness of life, both now and in the hereafter. One of the things I speak a lot here at Holy Cross about is that Christ, Jesus, is the representative of all humankind, that he is the vicarious man, and that when Jesus said something about himself, it becomes a principle applying to every one of us. A good example of this, particularly fitting for this moment, is when Jesus said to his followers in John 16, 22, I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. Now, if you know the story of Jesus, you know that he said that to his disciples before he was going to go away from them, his passion and so forth, in Jerusalem. But here's the thing. Jesus says these words as the perfect representative of the human race, right? And in recognition of the intensity of the bond that unites human hearts, and as a promise that those bonds shall not be weakened by the departure of a loved one, but rather intensified. In other words, Jesus spoke those words not only of himself, by himself, but as the representative of every one of us. And we are all justified, as strange as it may sound or even seem, in appropriating those words, universalizing them, using them ourselves knowing that they are spoken to everyone who mourns the loss of a loved one. Almost as though they had spoken it to the very ones who had passed on. I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. Jesus spoke those words for everyone who has ever died. He spoke those words for everyone who has ever mourned. And that is what it is for our lives to be in Christ, that great phrase we find so much in the New Testament. For 
That's what it is for him to be the vicarious man. That's what it is for us to live our lives in an intertwined kind of way with Gary. And so all the wonderful things about Gary that we remember, we need, we need, not, we need not merely remember them, right? As though that's all we need to do because there will be a reunion. Gary was, of course, I don't need to tell you all, an amazing guy in many ways. He would object to my saying that. He had a very obvious cross to bear. And he did so with an inner strength that, frankly, is hard to imagine if you think about it. And he knew where his strength came from. The one of his favorite verses in the Bible was 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 18, which says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That's quite a, that's quite a passage. Gary surely must have looked to the things eternal in his numerous daily struggles, and yet he didn't in the least, here's what's amazing, forget about things temporal. And in my opinion, this is one of the most remarkable things about Gary. You've got to pick one if you're in my position to talk about it. <laughs> and it's this, it's that he was an advocate, an advocate for those who shared his condition. And if you think of the courage and strength that must have taken, it's quite astounding. I remember going over to Gary's place a number of years ago, and some photographers had been over there. They'd taken the picture, in fact, I think they'd taken the picture that's up here on the table, the one that's on the back of the bulletins, and they were taking it for a brochure, which would be used to advocate for others who shared his condition, his condition. And I remember kind of laughing about that picture, because it's a, such a good-looking picture, and I said, Gary, you're about about on your way to Hollywood, and he said something like, I don't even know who that guy is. <laughs> <laughs> we shared plenty of laughs. But here's the point. Gary was an advocate. He really was. And interestingly, and this is most interesting indeed, I can think of another one who is said to be our advocate, one who in fact shared our condition. And you see, that's yet another example of Christ as the representative man in every way and in every one. In this case, manifesting it through the advocacy of one Gary Sullivan. In Gary's actions, we see Christ. If in Gary's actions we see Christ, then in our better actions we equally see him. And if he's the one who's working in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure, then he really is the representative of us all. And we really are, all of us, being brought to perfection. In this regard, John Dunn, the poet I quoted a few minutes ago, said this, All mankind is of one author, and is one volume. And when one man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book, but translated into a better language, and every chapter must be so translated. God's hand is in every translation, and his hand shall bind up all our scattered leaves again for that library where every book shall lie open to one another. Now, Dunn's not just saying that to be poetic. He was a spiritual writer, he was a priest, and he understood that all of that is part of what it is to have life, that be part of one another in life and in death, the, the, the part of what we call in the, in the church the communion of saints, right, as we call it. This is part of the oneness which St. Paul speaks of so frequently. This is what it is to be one in Christ, and ultimately what it is for all things, all created things, to go back to God when God will be all in all. One of the things I often say to this to the congregation here is that all of this stuff is a great mystery. I mean, it really is. We come to a place like this, we hear this kind of thing, we talk about it, and we just kind of go away, right? It's a great, it's a, it's a great mystery that we're talking about. How our lives are interconnected and how we are all being made one in Christ. And we probably need to be cautious in thinking we know too much about it all. I think that we do. It really is strange, isn't it, to speak about the life of, a, of another person. But we do know the important thing, and that is this. That because of Jesus, because of his incarnation, because of Jesus' resurrection, Gary, whom we all love, is all that he ever was, and now is me.
more and is increasing in God more and more and more. And then finally, we will meet again. Dealing with the loss is, of course, difficult, but it's bearable because we know this truth. And because Jesus said this in the Gospel reading, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, but I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. From my Sam, from my cousin Sam, who couldn't be here today. My grandpa was a spiritual father to me. I'm so thankful for his life and the person that Jesus made him to be. Even given his difficult health throughout his life, he taught me the most about joy and suffering. He didn't complain about him, his circumstances, but glorified God in them. I will forever treasure our visits to Tennessee and when he first met our daughter, Greta. He was so sweet to her, and even though he could not hold her, his words and affection towards her was like a physical hug. I love him so much, and I can't wait to see him walk, run, and dance. I will miss him dearly, but I'm thankful that he is safe in the arms of Jesus. Jesus, amen and amen. Are we not magnificently endowed by him? 
how privileged are we? And now Gary is with him, unfettered. Father Tim, members of the clergy, guests who joined us today, I'm Joe Whalen. I am Nancy's oldest son and Gary's stepson. On behalf of my mother, sisters, and their children, I thank you for the comfort that your attendance today brings to our family as we mourn that famous Stockton attorney, Gary Paul Sullivan. If there's just one thing to take away from our gathering today, it's this. If Gary knew you, he loved you. It was, his fundamental, it was fundamental to his nature and his faith. That said, I can say for certain that he'd sooner endure an I IRS audit or a pine cone enema than be <laughs> eulogized before friends, family, and witnesses. <laughs> and honestly, I feel kind of the same way about delivering eulogies, but when a mother calls, you answer. <laughs> so let's soldier on, and maybe he'll forgive us. Gary was the beloved son of Laverne and, Min and Minnie, brother to Norma, Junior, Jim, Jeanette, and Hattie, father to Gary Ju Junior, Kelly, and Jeanette, and grandfather to 12 wild, smart, and beautiful grandchildren, uncle to at least a dozen loyal nephews and nieces, stepfather to four of my brothers and sisters, and husband of 50 years to my mother Nancy. They celebrated their golden anniversary last August on this day. So now let's just take a moment to talk about pork rinds. <laughs> because if you know pork rinds, you know my stepfather. He could be crispy and salty on the outside, and at times a little greasy on the inside. But when he was in the room, there were few who could resist reaching for more of it. Gary loved pork rinds like cheap American beer, and to be truthful, his appetite was like a line out of that famous David Allen Coe song, Oh Lord, I'm a junk food junkie, good Lord, have pity on me. <laughs> but Gary Sullivan I knew was a social cyclone, as Father Tim referenced. He was called Grandpa Gary, Uncle Gary, Dad, Gary Dad, Honey, Brother Gary, Big Gary, Mr. Sullivan, Your Honor, Chief Justice Sullivan of the Fort Peck Court of Appeals for the Assiniboine and Sioux Tribes, and of course, that famous Stockton attorney, although he'd just as likely answer to East Stockton Oki. <laughs> he grew up in East Stockton, California, a place that I imagine is not all that different from South Nashville. If you wanted to survive there, you kept your head down or you learned how to fight. And if you learned how to fight, better win. Otherwise, laying low wouldn't be an option for you from that point forward. <laughs> as the youngest and smallest of the boys in the family, he was looked after by his brothers as well as a couple of his meaner sisters. <laughs> but after his older brother, Junior, was killed in a car accident, Gary fell in with some, some of the neighborhood rough trade, got into a few scrapes, dropped out of high school, and tried living by his wits. He learned the value of a sucker punch, and how to talk his way out of a jam. Soon enough, though, it was clear to him that if he didn't want to end up like Junior or spend his life behind bars, he'd better get on another team. So he joined the Army and then enlisted with the California Army National Guard. His Army tour in Germany must have impressed upon him that there's no more powerful weapon or foe than an educated mind, or at least the appearance of one. Fast forwarding a few years through his marriage to his first wife, Jill, and the birth of Gary Jr. and Kelly, he dedicated himself to business success and self-improvement through reading and work. He ordered the Harvard Classics Library, the great book series, and every self-business, self-help book or tape he could get his hands on. They sit on his shelves to this day. I can't say for sure that he's ever cracked a single one, because the only books he ever mentioned to me were the Bible, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, and Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. 
Nonetheless, before he was diagnosed with the disease that engaged him in the longest and most brutal fight of his life, he got his GED and used the GI Bill to complete the curriculum required to challenge the law school admissions test so he could attend law school. He did so while loading sacks of U.S. mail during the graveyard shift, studying all afternoon, commuting from San Jose to San Francisco Law School in the evening, and all while keeping a roof over the heads of a family of eight. A little better than halfway into law school, Gary was struck with a muscular dystrophy diagnosis, but pressed on to finish his final year and pass the California bar exam, graduating first in his class. Gary was now competing with men of letters and playing for keeps. Over the next 45 years, this famous Stockton attorney established his law practice, eventually moving to North Dakota to be closer to Kelly and her three boys. He loved winning, and he really loved a long shot. He was generous in victory, but he was going to beat you first. <laughs> he loved to bet the horses, and was a loyal 49er fan well before their string of Super Bowl victories under Bill Walsh. He started Dakota Internet Access with two partners and introduced the internet to Northwestern North Dakota, providing him his greatest business success. Shortly after, he was invited to sit the bench of the tribal court of the Fort Peck Assiniboine Sioux Nation, where he ultimately served as the Chief Justice of the Appellate Court. He poured himself into this role, and the architecture of his legal decisions was regarded as masterful among tribal jurists across, jurists across the country. His arguments were carefully researched and powerfully made, and he kept winning. Of course, the hazard of winning big and often is that when loss comes, it can be debilitating in the moment, even as it makes for funny stories down the line. There was a time when, if the 49ers, game, the 49ers lost a game, Gary's depression was so serious that the entire household walked on eggshells for painfully two stupid weeks. <laughs> On another occasion, we once rolled up to the roulette wheel at the Horseshoe Club, a renowned Reno casino. Gary had a progressive betting system that he'd been testing for weeks on a roulette computer game at home. <laughs> and by God, he was about to take down Benny Binion's house on Virginia Street. <laughs> Our East Stockton Oakey had a $2,500 stake, and he put, a, he put $5, a $5 chip on the black. The ball landed on red. <laughs> So he doubled down and put another $10 on the black in order to win back his initial lost bet, and so forth, doubling down with every loss against the spin of the wheel. That ball landed on everything but black for something like 13 straight spins, <laughs> and quickly obliterated his entire stack of chips. And then, of course, after the chips were gone, the ball landed in black on the very next spin. <laughs> Think and grow rich, my friends. <laughs> That was the second longest ride home of my life, but it's a huge, huge relief to laugh about it now. <laughs> <laughs> to be certain, if all the world's a stage, as Shakespeare once said, Gary's had three rings and he stood squarely in the center, barking at passers-by and cracking his whip. There were monkeys. Some of them had wings. A few of the actors were strung together with tight ropes. And among the lions, distracted by the noise and the spectacle, some of the clowns were tearing up behind the smile, the smiles. Gary Paul Sullivan died on July 15th in the arms of my mother, the woman he once described as every woman I've known or will know. He outlived, outlived his own expectations and half of American men by three to four years. He leaves behind my mother who is stronger, wiser, and closer to God for her life at his side. His children, Gary Jr., a poet and music critic. Kelly, the founder and publisher of Heart River Voice, Dickinson, North Dakota's finest monthly. Jeanette, our family's golden-throated golden recording artist. And, and 12 faithful children with nothing but adventure and opportunity flowering before them in these dystopian times. And here I stand, still delivering his eulogy. So having said all of that, I'll leave it to you to decide if the East Stockton Oki, that famous Stockton attorney, learned how to fight or knew how to win.
together in the Lord's Prayer. Amen.
Thanks, Peter.